Hello, friends. My name is Steve, and this is episode two of Page Chewing with P.L. Stewart. And we are joined tonight by a very special guest, Jenny Wirtz. Jenny, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Yeah, I'm glad we can all uh, be in the same place at the same time. It's it's kind of it's kind of tough sometimes, but we appreciate your time. So, how far are we reaching here? All the way to Canada? I'm in Florida, and you're where, Steve? Uh, I'm in New Mexico. So yeah. Wow, yeah. wow, that's a big triangle. Yeah, it is a big triangle. <laughs> I'd like to rob you guys of some of your warmth, though, right? Take a little bit from New Mexico, a little bit from Florida. You know that Jack Jack, uh, our temperature here up. Uh, definitely uh, a couple of degrees so well you know if i could bottle it and mail it i wouldn't have any problem meeting the bills would i <laughs> <laughs> that'd be expensive shipping i think yeah shipping's already kind of ridiculous and, and johnny before we went live you were telling us about a convention you just went to uh recently well, I drove up yesterday to the International Conference on the Fantastic in the Arts. They do this every year in Orlando, Florida, and they bring scholars from all over the world and they do papers. Actually, it's very serious. They present papers on the fantasy, science fiction, and it covers not just books, but movies, just about every, every medium, comics. And a lot of authors show up there. A lot of editors show up there and it's in my backyard. So yeah, I whipped up there to drop off some books and say hey to people first outing since the pandemic started. So it was kind of culture shock. Yeah. Good to see people again. And that's a pretty nice one too, because a lot of it, the people hang out at the pool bar, so you can be outside and not in a closed room or anything like that. So it's really very pleasant. It's a, and it's just about March every year. They do it every year. So we do have a couple of comments uh, from Stinky Chicken. Hi from Australia. Hi, Australia. Wow. Yeah. And uh, Shelf Standard is here. Chris, thanks for coming by. Uh, Lauren Lullabies. Oh, there's no Lullabies. She's, yeah, Australia. And uh, Derry's here. Uh, hello, welcome, Jenny, and welcome, PL. Wow. Thank you. So we have a couple of Australians here joining us tonight. Down under. Yeah, really cool. They that Their country is absolutely the top of the world. We had so much fun when we went there. I will never, never forget it. Yeah, it sounds like a beautiful place. Um, they say that it's similar, very similar to Canada in terms of, you know, just I guess the structure, the government. Just, just there's a there's a vibe. A lot of my Canadian friends who've been there, do they just say that it's 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 similar, except obviously a lot warmer and <laughs> it's beautiful. So. Well, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Parts of it reminded me of California. Parts of it was totally different. I mean, you know, you order a burger and it doesn't look like anything that you get here. They do different things in slightly different ways, but the beer is top notch. The people are very warm. We went all over the country. We even went to Alice Springs and out to Tasmania. We were on the West Coast. We were on the East Coast. And uh, everywhere we went, people went out of their way to be super nice. So I have a warm spot in my heart for Australia. Definitely, I'd go back in a heartbeat. Oh. What, what was your favorite uh, favorite beer when you visited there? We tried so many different beers, I couldn't begin to remember <laughs> because every time we stopped in, in a local area and we would see the local readers and fans, we would ask them to bring their favorites. So we tried everything. <laughs> Um, so a lot of small breweries, a lot of, you know, so I couldn't begin to remember them all because there were so many and they were all good. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, I, I, obviously, you know, so many people in the writing community over your, your, your lengthy and illustrious career. You have any favorite Australian writers, um, that come to mind that. Juliet Marillier pops into my head right away. Um, gosh, there's so many. And for one thing, Australia is very good with their women writers. So a lot of the women that I've read, I might have read them and not even known they're from Australia. Um, so I don't pay attention too much to the locale where people to come from. I'm more just into the stories. But definitely Juliet is from there. Yeah. Yeah. Never met her, but I've read her books. And uh, Shelf Center mentioned Will Elliott is an Australian author. Okay, and there's a bunch in New Zealand too. Yeah, we do have. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Pax Panic is here. Hey, Pax, and Pax was actually she recommended the title for the show, Page Chewing. So, thanks. Hey, great job, Pax. 
Yes. And uh, Darius from New Zealand. Oh, wonderful. All I ever saw was the airport on the way to Australia. It broke my heart. We got to get there someday. <laughs> yeah, kind of like Australia's cousin, New Zealand. You know. Yeah, kind of well, we were going to try to go down there for the Worldcon, and then the pandemic was coming, and that kind of just squashed it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate what that's done um, to, uh, we spoke about this on the last episode of Page Chewing with Steve and um, T.L. Coughlin, wonderful, wonderful Y writer, Sean Bell, another great Y writer, both friends of mine, about uh, how what we've had to do to replace all these live uh, events, these author conventions and things like that, book fairs, you know, that it's it's been, been tough. Um, and, you know, that's why we're very grateful for people like Steve. I love embarrassing well, him. That's the thing, so. though. It's things like this that you're doing right now that have just blossomed. And I think in some ways I've talked to people or met people or listened to their podcasts or I know people. And now I'm just starting to meet them in person, you know, up at the international conference. Jimmy Nutt was there and I, I was just shocked. I wasn't expecting him to be there. And he walks in and I'm like, wow, I know who you are. So in some ways, this bad period has brought people together like never before. That's true. It's so strange, isn't it? Yeah. It's and certainly amazing. we've all read more books. Yeah. Yeah. What What are you reading right now, Jenny? What's, 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 uh... well, I'm reading your series for one. I really liked your book one and I'm on the edge of my seat for the second book because of, Blaze Ancona, Under the Radar books. I went and tried Adrian Tchaikovsky, and I totally yeah. fell overboard and loved Shadows of the App. I really liked Miles Cameron books. I started with his books a couple of years back, but I discovered him through the International Conference on the Fantastic because I was just fuming out, smoking out my ears, saying I really need a book that I'm going to really like. And somebody said, have you tried this? And I went for it. The Red Knight just blew me off. Oh, yeah, board. yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So, um, there's a handful. Um, I've got more that are in process, but I got to order the prequel because I accidentally got the sequel. So I also like Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Liadon books. So there, that one I'm going to catch up with, but I found I, I'm out of order. I got to order a title that's in between. Hmm. So CJ Cherry's Foreigner series, there's another favorite. Um, I have so many favorites. It's a huge list. Hmm. So I'm angry at, at Kindle right now because Amazon told me my old Kindle, they were decommissioning it and they literally rubbed off all the books. It worked perfectly well. There was nothing wrong with it. Uh -huh. They said, we're no longer supporting this unit too old. And when I went to read the books on it, gone. Yeah. So I'm not real fond of eBooks anymore. After that happened, I said, forget this. I'll try to go with paper. Well, yeah, there's, the, I, I'm the same as Steve. I'm, I think you, you, prefer physical books as well. There's nothing like having that that feel in your hand. And Jenny, with your books, I mean, obviously, I mean, your series is, you know, quickly become my favorite uh, fantasy series of, of all time. And wow, that's the one, the one, the one book and, and it's just, and you're, you're Ill, but, but the, the added dimension is that, you know, some people uh, out there may or may not know about you is that you're a world-class illustrator. You know your 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 illustrations have hung in in major art galleries. You've won awards. Like, can you tell us about about that? Like, what? Like, how, you know, I mean, it's just so incredible that you have both those talents and spades to be such an iconic writer and then to be such a phenomenal illustrator. Like, you know, where, where's all this talent come from, man? It's just good genes. Uh, ditching like school, ditching school, literally. I was so bored in school. I couldn't stand the regimentation. I couldn't stand having to sit there and listen to teachers drone on when you could pick up what they were trying to tell you pretty quickly. And I learned about probably about, oh, third grade, that if you try to slip a book behind your math book, they, the teacher would take it. She would confiscate it. And by the end of the year, you owed a huge library fine. And I had to earn all those at nickels and dimes. So. <laughs> I got very sneaky. I couldn't read. So I learned to doodle in the margins of my notes hmm. because if they caught you doodling, but you had your notes in the same notebook, they couldn't confiscate that. And if you drew in the left hand, you know, spiral notebook with the left hand margin, they couldn't tear the page out because 
they would take away your notes. So I drew in the margins of my French book, <laughs> my math book, and my notes. And I would get comments, you know, when they would collect the notes to grade them, because one history teacher, he would say, well, crappy notes, but beautiful drawings. <laughs> so at the end of this, the more you draw, the more you, you become able to draw. And at the time I wanted to decide to write, I had the ideas for the starting with the Wars of Light and Shadows literally in 1972. This was just after high school. I began designing this series, seriously designing it. And all the covers out there were women in metal armor and bikinis. And the big deal was Frank Fazetta. Now I've seen Frank Fazetta's originals and the man's a genius. It, they're absolutely breathtaking. Totally. You want to see these paintings, but it didn't suit my books. I could not see Arathon as this muscle bound, you know, I couldn't see that as a Frazetta painting, not in any way, shape or form. So my terror was that if I produced these books, I would get an illustration that was so wrong. And what I didn't know was at the time books were distributed by distributors who were truck drivers and they would go around to all the little independent distributor places like your drugstore, your newsstand, your airport, your pharmacy. This was not a national buyer back then. Your local truck guy would drive in there and he would rack the books and he liked the bikinis. He liked the boobs hanging out of the armor. So the more your book looked like that, the more he likely you would get on the book rack. Hmm. So this is why we had those lurid covers at the time. It had nothing to do with the readers. It had to do with pleasing the trucker who was going to stick it on the rack. So that's where I got serious. I said, I'm going to have to learn or take what drawing ability I have and push it to the max because I would like to see the characters match what I envision. And yeah, there are lots of talented artists. I know I could hand these books to anybody that, that I admire and they would do a stellar job of illustrating them and it would probably blow me away. In fact, it would blow me away. But the cool thing is you only have one shot at seeing what the author saw. Only one. So why not go for it? So I came out of college saying, I'm going to write and illustrate. And everybody said, you're freaking crazy. It's a full-time job. Either one, you can't possibly do most that both. And I said, well, you know, I grew up next to the Howard Pyle paintings in the Brandywine River Museum. He was a writer illustrator and he was the top of his field and both sections tell me i can't do it so i did that simple if you put the hours in you get the results okay. people don't get it that you aren't born with talent you're born with a drive and an interest and you create the the brain synapses to do what you do and it's not quick your brain does grow but it's slow so the first thousand drawings are garbage, as Don's teacher used to say. Don Mason, my husband, is an illustrator, too. The first X number of words you write are probably garbage, too. You know, I'm not saying there isn't a prodigy out there somewhere, but they probably had that interest, and they were probably thinking in terms of that for many more years than you saw until the page got in front of you. So I try to encourage people, don't be afraid to get in there and be awful at something. Because if you're awful at something for five years, at the end of five years, you are not going to be awful anymore. You're going to have what you need to go out there and go after it. And in this world, there is somebody in there with that knowledge in their head. There's a book with that knowledge somewhere in this world. There is a museum with that knowledge somewhere in this world. And if you want it, you don't need an education. You just got to be motivated enough to go after it because that knowledge is right there. And now that we have computers, now that we have the internet, it's more accessible than it's ever been before. So that's my opinion about what it takes to develop what you have. It isn't special. You're not born that way. You create that by your interest. Yeah, that's amazing. So how do you, I mean, now that you're, you're, um, you have, you've had, like I said, you've had such an illustrious career and, and it's obviously it's still ongoing and you look back over that career 
you know, you've seen all these significant and major changes to writing and publishing and, you know, just everything's just so different from, from when you started. How do you, how do you, how do you look back in retrospect and, and assess that? And, and where do you think everything's going? Well, thank God I didn't know when I started because at the time I began, editors had lifelong jobs. We had editors in this field for 40 years, people like Judy Linden Del Rey, Lester Del Rey. There are very few of those left. Maybe Betsy Walheim and her crew are about the last holdouts that have been at it this long, maybe Ginger Buchanan. There are a few, but it's no longer a lifetime job. The people are horribly overworked. Um, if I'd known I was launching this 11 book series in the middle of this kind of changes, I would have been terrified. I probably would have run for cover. I would have been way smart and said, don't do this because the field changed all around me. Everything fell apart and got put back together six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times, 15 times. I've had so many editors I can't count anymore because it keeps getting handed off because they leave their jobs. They come, they go. Companies merge. Um, so whole i had to stay steady through all of this upheaval and it's quite a history a lot of people don't understand how the field got the way it got or why it looks like it looks today i happened to rent a carriage house apartment on the property of an author daniel mannix and he had seen the 40 or 50 years prior so i've got a long reach seeing how far things have changed and what it was like and when i first got Harold Matson from my age, and he was in his late 80s, 90s. He had seen publishing from long before now, when agenting was considered a really dirty, crooked field. He brought some ethics into the field. He's a legend. So I have a long, 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 long reach as to how we got where we got. And the only thing I can say is the more you know, the more you can juggle it. The more you understand the pressures on the people you're working with, whether it's somebody who's self-publishing or somebody who's doing traditional work, or you've got to work with somebody who's in corporate and you know exactly what they can't say and what they can't do. You have to learn how to work with that. And that requires a lot of homework. And some people are not willing to put that time in. So I would have been terrified. Where's it going? I have no idea. The one thing I know is story has been here since man created language. We learn things through story, it is, it is built into our brains. So I don't see story going anywhere. And I don't see books disappearing because frankly, you don't need an electrical socket to read a book. I could have a complete blackout, the world could fall apart with a hurricane here and I could still read a book. So I hope books aren't going away. I would fight to keep them simply because it's unilateral access. You don't need any privileged background to pick up a book. You just have to learn to read. And that's the only stumbling block. So where are we going? I don't know. I probably won't live to see all of it, but I'll just keep doing what I've always done, which is if I want to get something done, I'll figure out a way to do it. And then I'll move mountains and I'll build detours and and I'll continue blind on faith if I have to, knowing that when I get there, I'll find that bridge. I'll find that way to cross it and bring it in that 11 book series through all those changes. I'm telling you, it was war sometimes. It was exhilarating. It was terrifying. And sometimes there was no bottom. Sometimes I had nothing in front of me. Didn't know who was going to publish the ending of it. Did not know because the, the opening to get it done wasn't there. I had to find it. Yeah, it's, it's just so fascinating to hear you know, and and I and I say this all the time. You know, and I and I'm not saying to embarrass you, um, but but it's certainly it's certainly the truth that that you are an iconic writer, and to hear someone like you say that about writing and uh, just a bit a few of your your trials and tribulations, you think, wow, you know, okay, well, jenny has gone through this, so you know, I have to keep persevering because you know she's 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 been there, done that, knows the game inside out and has has built such a, a sterling reputation and such a, a great track record and incredible incredible craft and you know you're an internationally best-selling author you know i mean it's 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 just incredible to hear you speak about part a bit of your journey um, I think people need to understand that nobody necessarily had it handed to them that is extremely rare 
I mean, yeah, you get a one book wonder, had to hand it to them, suddenly they can't write book two or book three. That happens. But more often than not, I don't want to name names because I don't want to embarrass anyone who's a peer of mine. But one writer who was best selling, and I'm talking real best selling, 40 rejections on his first novel, 40 rejection slips, 40. Still going. Talked to him yesterday. And he, he went on to become a huge selling author. Another one, probably top of the field. The whole world knows this guy's name. Career crashed and restarted his career in mid-curve, switched from science fiction to fantasy. Now is a world-renowned name. Everybody goes through it. If you're here long enough, you have to reinvent the wheel. Somewhere along the line, whatever you started on is going to dissolve. And you'll have to figure out how to reassemble it again. This is, I read a statistic of, of about a year ago that just shocked me. It said, this many people, if you have 100% of writers that do one book, 100% is one book. It drops to about 90 that do two. It drops to 75% that do three. And then after that, off the cliff, only about 20% do more than three books. And I'm going like, whoa, I didn't know that. So look how many people drop off the edge. And that's why I'm big on resurrecting titles that people have forgotten about or, or titles that were really, really good. And I know the writer is still alive, but they got discouraged and they stopped. And that's why I really admire Blaze and Kona's Under the Radar because he focuses on books people don't. He's not following the crowd. And there is more good material that has been lost than good material that's being produced every month today. So it's really important not to look at books as being dated or just because you didn't hear about it, it's lousy, it's not necessarily. And you can't even go by what you find in the used bookshops because I've scoured used bookshops all my life, you know, coming home once from scouring used bookshops. In high school, I got hit by a car on my bike because a guy pulled in front of me, he did an illegal turn and ran into me on my bike and the books went flying all over the road and I like jumped up back with a bike. I'm collecting all the books so the next cars don't run over them. But what I noticed about what you find in charity shops, you find books that are super popular. So there were millions of copies and there are plenty still left that people are turning over. Or you find books that really weren't that great or at least weren't for me, but there's a lot of them that just didn't work. The ones that were really good didn't have a big enough press room to even get on the used bookshelves, and they were the keepers. Almost never do you find those books on the used bookshelf. Did you ever find Heather Catlagadney, her, her Teot's War, on a used bookshelf? Very rare. Wonderful book, but everybody who got a hold of that book, me included, hung on to it. So used bookshops are a pitfall in some ways because you get exposed to the really popular or the ones that didn't quite click. Um, and you really have to dig sometimes to find the, the gold, but there is amazing stuff that people discount or this whole thing of any book written before the internet, well, we haven't heard of it, so it's dated and it must be, or this particular decade was just copies of Tolkien. That could not be further from the truth because in that decade when those copies of Tolkien, that was the route the mail writers took to get famous quickly. And so they sold high numbers. So those are the titles that were known because they got high press runs. But there was a ton of work being done original around the edges of that that would fit in right now today, even as diverse as today's writing is. There was gender diverse, there was people of color diverse, there was every kind of diverse around the edges, but it didn't get the press run, the attention, it didn't have the staying power because it wasn't quantifiable. So I don't even like tagging a decade of this is all that was written during that time because I can always name you titles that don't fit that mold. And they're wonderful. They're just as good today as they were when they were written. So couple of comments really quickly uh, from Stinky Chickens. PL, I have a few of Jenny's prints and they are truly phenomenal. And uh, Derry had a question. Uh, I have a question. How did Jenny come to work with Raymond uh, Feist for the Empire series? Uh, ha, ha. Ray had this idea and he wanted a 
woman for a lead character. And he had the first line of the book, first chapter, you know, the first opening, he had the opening and he had the ending, but he didn't have a middle. He didn't have the middle of the book at all. And he was terrified to write a female character. And so he came to me because he had read Sorcerer's Legacy. And he said, there was a lot of political maneuvering in that book and it was all done with mirrors. It had a lot of intrigue. And that was my first novel, but I was writing my fourth at the time he was chasing me to do this collaboration. And I kept saying, no, 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 Ray, you can do this yourself. I said, I'll read whatever you write. I will help you get the, the female character right. You know, I'll just help you get her perspective right until you, and he went after me for two years and I go, no, 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 Ray, I got this huge series, like this light and shadow series. It's not near being published yet. I'm still working on other things to, to build my name ahead of when I launch that, but I don't have time for this. And finally, he wore me down so bad that I had to say yes, because the world was so undeveloped on that side of the rift. He had developed parts of it in Magician, but it really required a lot of Machiavellian thinking. Hmm. And so finally, the story just got me. It just bit me on the butt. And I said, all right, Ray, and I crumbled and we did it. And so that very first opening where the main character, Mara, loses her family and suddenly she's got a role and she's pulled out of a religious order and she doesn't know what she's doing. That was his idea for the start. To the finish of Servant, which I won't tell you in case you haven't read the series, um, that was the original bit that he had to start. And the rest we developed together, 50-50, 100% together. We worked through all of it. So we just couldn't fit it all in one book. And when we finished with Servant, we looked at each other and said, this couldn't continue without the magicians getting really, 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 really upset because Mara was getting too powerful. So that was how the third book was born. So we did all three and it's a pretty complete story exactly as it stands. There isn't anything more that I would want to add to it, nor Ray either. So that's how it happened. Wow. We, were, we were doing dial up by the modem, exchanging files. It was really funny. Computers were just getting going then. So it was a dial up modem. And so we actually overwrote each other's files. We would draft a section and flip the files. And so we wouldn't keep track of who wrote what. You would just get it back in another iteration and it looked more smooth than it was when you send it out. So we just kept sending the files back and forth until you couldn't tell who did what. And it was all seamless. Wow, that's amazing. And now, of course, um, you know, the, the big news is that, um, you know, someday we're going to see that um, on the bigger, small screen. Uh, we hope con so. Six congratulations studios on that. Six studios picked it up. I don't know where they're going to have it land, but we're very hopeful and they're very enthusiastic. And certainly they have a great love of the story. So I'm pretty confident they'll do a, a fantastic job. So we're pretty excited to see what comes out of it. We could have the next big, uh, big, big uh, fantasy uh, series uh, or movie coming out of that. And that would be phenomenal. Uh, that would just be phenomenal because, you know, the world is just hungering for these things, right? I think it's a really, really good time for this to happen because it has a mix of viewpoints. And Ray went out of his way and I went out of my way. We wanted to, to show more facets of cultures coming together and things that would drive cultures apart. And I had actually been to Korea and I had traveled around there and stayed with a friend of mine who had married a Korean wife. They're still married now. And he was in animation and I got to go all over the entire country. I got the guided tour of the whole place. So a lot of what I encountered, I, I couldn't speak Korean and Kyung could barely speak English. So just, some of the concepts and the ideas that happened in the course of that trip showed me that if you don't know their stories, no wonder we have wars. It's a mess. When I went there, this is a fascinating thing where you hit a culture, cultural moment where everybody's making assumptions and nothing works. John told me I'm having trouble with Kyung. 
I give her these beautiful gifts. She'll admire something and I'll get her something, some really nice piece of jewelry for her birthday. And she'll put it in a drawer and never touch it again. And he said, I can't figure this out. It's driving me crazy. It's upsetting me. I don't know if I'm being played or what's going on. So he said, can you try to figure out while oh, you're traveling all over the country, what's going on here? So in Kyung's broken English and my effort, I finally found out that in her culture, if you get a gift from somebody and you don't like them and you don't care about it, you use it to death till it's worn out. You'll wear that dress every day or that piece of jewelry until it's done. If you respect that person, you might wear it once in your life to a very important occasion. If that person is sacred to you, if they're close to you, you keep it in the original wrapping and it gets put in a drawer because it's too special to show to anyone. And when I said to her, well, Kyung, you know, in America, if your husband gives you a gift and you never wear it, it means, and I gave her the, the symbol, the symbol that I can't do live here. And she goes, really? And I said, really? So here was this thing where they, they just missed. Each one would have been offended if they hadn't understood culturally, they were at opposite ends of the pole. How many times do we meet someone from another country, another culture, another tribe, another background, another walk of life, and we miss because we don't have the cultural common ground or experience to understand what they're telling us? It's heartbreaking, especially now with all the noise on the internet where everybody's so quick to judge and quick to say somebody's doing this or doing that. Did you really take the time to listen to their story? Because maybe what they're telling you isn't what you're hearing at all. Yeah, you, um, uh, that's, that's so such a moving story, Jenny. And, you know, that gets me thinking about, um, for me, what is my absolute favorite standalone novel uh, to date? You actually got me, got me reading. I w I'm not a big standalone person, but but thanks to reading to ride Hell's Chasm, which is my favorite current standalone to date. That I, I actually am gonna. I'm giving standalones much more of a chance. But what you said brings to mind um, what you did and the courage you showed to write uh, to ride Hell's Chasm and and feature. Uh, the main character, a person of color, and and depict, um, you know, the prejudice that that really, um, you know, confounded, um, you know, the 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 story, the people, you know, it, it was just like, I I just for those who haven't read that book, I, I recommend anyone anyone who likes fantasy and anyone who likes compelling themes go out and, and read that. Just what what went into writing that? Like what what made you write something like that then when you wrote it? A lot of things went into that book. A lot of things went into that book. The, the theme you brought up of, of a person of color in a society, think Switzerland's, that's very homogenous where everybody's from the same background and they're kind of isolated by the mountains, would be a fish out of water. And I thought, what if you had a person that was such a fish out of the water, the people couldn't wrap their minds around anything outside of what they'd been or what they had seen. And what if that person had more experience, more education, more awareness of the problem that was going to attack their kingdom than they did? Would they be heard? Would they be heard? So that was what led into it and how big a fish out of water can you make the character? Well, I reached as far and wide as I could because I have been fortunate to have talked to some elders from cultures that are not mine. I've traveled a bit of the world and I've been in a in position to observe some treatment of people that just made me so angry and there wasn't a lot I could do but listen. And so maybe this was some way to get it out of my system to say, I see this stuff every day or I'm working with people and I'm trying to get people to step over their prejudice or their boundaries or their assumptions. And they just won't go because they're locked in their box so tight because they're scared or because their background or because they just 
we get taught very early to chuck out our imagination and not think out of the box. And think about it, you grow up reading books, you're already out of the box, you're treated like somebody weird because you're always got your nose in the book, you're not part of the in crowd. And the people who are not part of the in crowd do suffer a certain amount of punishment. And what if you're not part of the in crowd and you're marked because of the color of your skin or the background or the language you're speaking or your religion, I don't care what it is, you're gonna get hit with that harder and you can't necessarily shed that. So I wanted the character to have to keep his sanity through this big mess of problems. I mean, the kingdom is on the line. And what happens when these social pressures start pushing you in a direction where you know what you're doing, but no one believes you? That was one thing. Another one was I've ridden horses all my life. I've seen what they can do. And I've seen tremendous abuse of animals and horses. I've seen people just take what those horses will give you and exploit it. And I said, I'm going to write a book which strips that off and makes you cry when you see it happen because they're living beings and they have as much personality as we do. And if you ever saw the movie War Horse, um, what horses have done for the human race all through history, all cultures is phenomenal and they're not given their due. So I took the Tevis Cup, which is like um, an endurance race that goes 100 miles in 24 hours in very extreme terrain. It's an endurance race. And I said, what if it required these horses to do an endurance run? And if they those horses failed, the kingdom would not make it. So I threw that in there. And then I also threw in the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. You know, we're always talking about rule of law, but a law gets written and there's a spirit in the way it's written. And then you get these people that all they want to do is tear that down and use that law to punish. And the spirit of the law is no longer there. It's just this thing on the book that's hurting people. So how do we decide what is the spirit of the law and what is the letter of the law? So Mikhail, who's the person of color and the hero of this book, is the spirit of the law versus Taskin, who's very fair, very fair minded man, but he is the letter of the law. And there's room for both, but there's a balance that has to be kept. And often that balance is ignored. And the last thing I wanted in that book was the sense of the warrior. We talk about war and we talk about the big causes and we talk about the generals and we talk about the leaders and we talk about history being written by the victor, all that stuff that glorifies war. But I think war comes down to the individual. If you don't pull that trigger, war won't happen. And I think often in a big problem situation, we give up our individual power. We stop making those choices and we get swept along with the crowd. We give our individual power away and really our individual power is everything. It is everything. And so I wrote the book from that standpoint also. So here we have this warrior. What happens if he doesn't do what he's told? Because ethically it isn't right. How do we parse this? So yeah, if everybody stopped shooting, there would be no war. If everybody took that personal responsibility, there would be no war. And yeah, we're not in a perfect world. We're not gonna see that perfect scenario or I won't live to see it, but I wish. And so a lot of times I will write something into a book where it's, I wish it was this way. And so I'll throw it in there because I really not only wanna tell a good story, not only wanna get people to empathize with an experience they've never had, I also want them to think a little bit and take a piece of that away so you walk away with a little bit more personal power because you thought about what was happening on that page. And certainly that carried through the empire, it carried through Hell's Chasm, it carried through Wars of Light and Shadows. Every book I've written has a bit of that. that we are not victors or victims, we're the masters of our situation if we only have the courage to take that moment and use it. And it takes huge courage because the crowd is not necessarily going to follow you. Yeah, that's a that's a poignant. Oh, that's a Jenny. That's a, that's extremely relevant. You know, it's always been relevant, but but very very uh, meaningful, especially in light of what's going on today, what we see today, and 
Yeah. Oh, today is heartbreaking. It's just destroying everybody who's witnessing what's happening. And I only hope we can come out of it better somehow. But, you know, it, thinking of that, thinking out the box and thinking of that maverick attitude of making your personal choice despite the pressure it's really important as a creator to do that too, because you're not going to get people encouraging you. It does not happen. People want to keep you safe. They want to keep you in that box. They don't want you to take chances. Oh no, don't be that writer illustrator. You can't possibly succeed at that. And so you have to become the lone wolf. You have to stand outside the crowd a bit. You have to push off the people who would tell you what to write or how to write it or what you should or shouldn't be doing or how you should go about learning how to do what you're doing. There's a maverick element and a lone wolf element to taking your brand or making that mark on the world that you were born to do. I've said to everybody who wants to dare to try it, don't expect people to help you because when it comes down to the knit and the grit of the moment, you are alone and it's you telling them what to do, not the other way around. So you need to learn to push back a bit and realize if you don't tell your story, nobody else can. If you don't develop that talent of yours, if you don't do what you love, nobody else can. And humanity as a whole loses by that because there will never be another person like you. Your viewpoint is completely unique. And if you don't use that, it's gone. And we lose, we all lose. So it's yeah. important, you know, when you when you go to an auction and they say this is a one of the kind, that's the most expensive thing in the auction because it's unique. Well, that's you. That's you. But it takes courage to grab that with both hands and run for it. Yeah, Jenny, and, and we so admire your courage and we're grateful for it. Um, your courage that's really evident in your writing and how you conduct yourself. You know, when you talk about that, one of the reasons why a lot of people self-publish um, besides, you know, uh, you know, some of the, the other reasons, you know, one of it is because people who self-published feel that they wouldn't be able to quite tell their story the way they'd like to um, when they, if they traditionally published when, when they have a traditional publisher more, more, more involved in dictating, um, you know, what the story is about in order to sell the story because, um, you know, making, making sales and making money is the end goal. With your show publishing, how do you how do you reconcile that? Like, how did you know? Obviously, you you went through, you you must have had to um, inferring here. Maybe it's not true, but you must have had to stand up your different parts of your uh, during your career to say this is the story I want to write. And maybe there was some pushback. And how did you deal with that being traditionally published? Um, you know, people get it backwards. The publisher is not the tail wagging the dog. So it isn't about what the publisher is doing at all. It isn't about that. They're not telling you what to write and they're not telling you how to write and they're not, you create what you create. You create that and that creates a nexus of thrust or energy because now once you've got that in your hand and once you've learned your craft and that requires pushing yourself harder than you ever believed you had to, once you have that, now you look at the whole planet. What do I need to get this done? And there's many, many ways to skin a cat. So too many people that are entering writing that, that say this or that about traditional public, don't look at that. You are the one that created. You are the one that originated. You are the one filling that page. Then look at the entire planet. Tell me you can't find 100,000 people that are going to like what you're doing or a method that's going to deliver what you are doing to the public, whether it's a book or any other thing. So I would say to anybody, stop looking at the rule book before you look at what you're making. Make what you make. Then look and see whose rule book fits it and make sure that you've developed your craft and your talents strong enough to make it worth somebody else's time to look at what you're doing because you're asking them to give a piece of their lifetime to look at what you've done. That's a huge, huge thing you're asking of them to give them a piece of your time. So make it worthwhile. Did you polish your craft enough? Did you work hard enough to give them something back for them giving them a piece of their lifetime? 
Uh, so that's the way I look at it is I flip that situation completely upside down. It has nothing to do with what the rules are or who's dictating or gatekeeping. Throw all that out, make what you're making, then look where it fits. And as you're making it, you're gonna see the openings as to where it fits because you train your mind to see what you want it to see. You see the end goal. I wanna connect with the world in this way. You could walk past 50 opportunities because you eliminated in your mind what was even possible. That's not how you do it. You create what you create, and then you see where the opportunities fit what you're doing. And because you're looking to reach that endpoint, you will notice the opportunities. I'll tell you a funny research paper I once read about a study being done on people who thought they were lucky and thought they were not lucky. And they were handed a magazine page and told there's X number of pictures on this page and you're looking for Y in these pictures. And how many of these pictures have it? Well, the unlucky people slaved over it for hours and never got them all. The people who thought they were reasonably lucky counted and got it right because they were they believed they, they were gonna succeed, so they saw the success. The ones who thought they were lucky saw the thing on the first page that said there are 42 images in this on this page that have what you're looking for. So if you run around thinking the world has no opportunities, guess what? You just slam the door on a whole pile of them and they're gone. So you have to look for the opportunities based on what you're doing. And that has saved me many times because when the Wars of Light and Shadow was being written and there was a massive merger in the US, I lost my US publisher at a time when the whole field was imploding and there was no way I was gonna easily get all these books back in print and I had to actually wait five years for the rights to revert before I could even start. And by then all the record that I'd been here was pretty well gone. So how did I do this? I sold it over to London because London was still sort of creeping along with it. So I got it into London, but I couldn't get it into the US. And I didn't tell myself this is impossible. I didn't tell myself I had to have a US publisher. I didn't, I was reading Locus and there was one little tiny line that said there was one little tiny piece of HarperCollins in London that was selling books into the US. And it was cookbooks. It was freaking cookbooks. But I said, I don't care. They have a distribution channel to get the books to the US. So I hammered my, publisher in London to buy the US rights, knowing they weren't gonna be in Books A Million, they weren't gonna be in all the major, they'd be in some of the chains, but not all of them, but at least it got it back here. Would I have seen that one line in Locus if I hadn't been looking for a way to kind of jam this through the cracks? And so, yeah, that's how I did it. It, it went through a little distributor, independent distributor in Chicago, which is why the Light and Shadows was available here, but a lot of people are convinced it never got finished because you're not publishing those anymore. Because so it was going through a little distributor in, in Chicago. Then HarperCollins develops Harper 360. Now it's being distributed right from New York. But that didn't exist when I found that little loophole. So that's what I meant where sometimes it's war. You have to just look for what fits what you need to have done. And then you need to see that opportunity and it may come out of left field, but if you're convinced there's a gatekeeper or there's this or that preventing, you're not gonna see the hole in the wall that would let you walk right through. So think about what you wanna do, develop what you wanna do, and then look to see where you can fit it in because there will be a place it can land. If you develop it and you make it worth somebody's time to look at it, you'll find a place to do it. That's that's phenomenal advice, and and you talk about motivation and uh, inspiration. That's that's it right there. What what you just said. And People walk from... right by opportunity every day because they're too busy whining about what they can't get, and they'll walk right by the person who could hand it to them. I've seen it happen at conventions. I've seen it happen. So you know, you just have to every week wash off your negativity and pick yourself up by the bootstraps. There is no other way I know to do it because you're not necessarily going to be the rock star of your generation. You have to go on as if you would be, whether it happens or not. What matters is that you, you do your thing. That, that's amazing, Jenny. So, so, so where do you see self-publishing fitting 
in all of this, you know, based on what you're saying, like where, where does, you know, I, I'm a self-published author. Where, do, where do we all fit based on, on what you're saying? Self-publishing has grown up. When I first got going, it was a mess. It was a complete mess. And now I'm seeing, I've read many self-published books right from the start when it began to happen. People would hand me books. And if you hand me a book, I'm always going to finish it. Always going to finish it. I, if I don't like it, I'm not going to say anything. If I like it, I'm going to be pretty loud about it. Over the years, the books have gotten better and better and better. They've gotten better edited, better written, better artwork, better presentation. They now, you pick up a self-published book, and if you didn't know it was a self-published book, you wouldn't know because it's rivaling what a major house can do. So the sky's the limit. You know, if people are going to put that much trouble into making it worth my time to read their books, I'm not going to discriminate what label is on the back and who published it. A story, a good story is a good story. The trick is for published and self-published and or authors who are not having the humility to really take a hard, cold look at what you're doing and say, how can I do better? And I'm not talking about listening to every screaming reviewer on the Internet. Sorry, but every book isn't written for every person. And you can get terrible reviews and that book just didn't fit what that person expected or wanted at the time. And your book plus them is alchemy because they're going to read that book and it's not the book you thought you wrote. It's going to be your book plus their own experience laid on top. So I don't recommend taking criticism from randos on the internet. I recommend doing it by talking to people that you respect and you already know that they understand what they're doing. But it's tough when you're asking for critiques because honestly, most people don't know how to do it. I used to sell 40 page reads in charity auctions where I would say, whoever wins the charity auction, give your money to charity. I will read 40 pages of whatever work in progress you got going. I don't care if it's the first chapter, the last, the middle, you know, short, piece of a novel, I don't matter. Give it to me and I will read it and I will critique this and I will help you get it ready to go if I can. Most people read it and they complain about what didn't work for them. That's not how I come by about a critique. A critique is only valuable if you take what you've read and you ask the person who wrote it, what was it you were trying to do in this paragraph or this page or this 40 page section of a manuscript? What were you trying to make me feel here? What was I supposed to get out of it? Now, I listened to what you told me you wanted on that page. And then I look at what I didn't get. And I can say, okay, here's what you didn't write. This is what is missing. This is why I didn't get what you were trying to do. This is where I got lost. And here's where you need to work on it to put what you want in. So I get what you put in out of it. They go back to writing and they're excited. They're absolutely wild because they saw where they missed the boat. It wasn't where I didn't get it. I'm not telling them how to write it. I'm not telling them to write some story they didn't try to. I'm going from what their heart wanted to say and saying, how can you clarify that? And lots of people don't know how to critique a book to bring the best out of the author because I'm not here to help you write my story or what I want to see on that page. I'm here to help you put what you wanted on that page so it reaches me. So I would tell anyone taking a manuscript to a workshop or a critique session or another writer or a beta reader, make sure you're getting your critique that way and not flipped upside down because otherwise you're going to get yanked a hundred different directions. Every person who reads it's going to yank you off your center you're going to get a hundred different takes because they're going to want to read a different story than what you wanted to write. So the critique has to support what it was you're trying to do. And that comes from understanding where you're coming from. So I would say take critique very seriously, take it with a grain of salt and choose who you get to help you very carefully because I've seen a lot of talent die by being pounded to death, wrong direction until they lose their way. So does that help you? Yeah, that's uh, it's 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 astoundingly um, great advice. 
like like all the advice you give um you know you're you're coming from the perspective of of someone who you know is not only insightful extremely insightful but who's been there uh you know kind of been there done that and that's that's such a treasure um but the the big treasure is that you're the person you are who's willing to you know provide that kind of feedback and that kind of advice and support authors and, and people in the writing community that way so that's a that's a real credit to you um you know it it it, it um it dispels if anybody's ever worried or concerned that you know oh, okay well you know well the so and so is a a really iconic writer a really important person they they you know i don't know if they'll have time for for me to to hear what i have to say or to you know well well you told me you chucked that out the window um just by listening to you and and getting to know you what a wonderful warm uh, genuine person you are and how you care about helping people and you know that definitely shines through in everything you do so thank you well, I wouldn't be here today if the right people hadn't showed me what to do and whether I sought them out or they helped me or they found something, you know, I wouldn't be here today. So I think we all do better when everybody does better. But what good is keeping all your knowledge to yourself? You got to get rid of your ego because you get to experience the world in a much more direct way if you don't carry your baggage with you and foist it on people. <laughs> I wouldn't have learned anything, you know, and like I said, I've gotten to sit at the feet of people in their 90s from other cultures that are definitely not mine. And I wouldn't have gotten what I got out of those experiences if I'd gone in there with opinions. I, I just want to touch quickly on, you know, your your War of Light and Shadow series, because that is your hallmark. That is a hallmark series. Um, that is your you know, your, your piece de resistance, um, that is just, <laughs> frankly, for me, and again, we talk about individual tastes and what people like, and it's all up to the reader. But for me, that is the best written fantasy book that I've, I've read. Ooh, my, that's, my life. I don't that's know, I, I can live up to it. Yeah, that's the best written, you know, there, there's things you like about different books. There's, there's, you know, you can say the best, you know, battle scenes or the best, you know, character development. Like that is the best written fantasy book for me uh, that I've read. So, what for those who, you know, uh, may not know know as much about, it, you know, what got you started on that series? What's it about? Like, you know, where did you know what are you what are you trying to what you can tell us, anyways? You know, for without spoilers, you know, what what is that? you know what what is it about and where 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 what does it what are some of the themes um that that went into that book well there are a lot of them and some of them are very very subtle that most people aren't even going to find i don't think i've encountered a reader yet who's dug to the bottom of it but that's okay it's all there to be discovered and also some of it doesn't come out till the final volume pretty much i started out with an idea in 1972 and i grew up with dark hair in a family full of blondes. I had one brother that had dark hair. And let me tell you, the blondes got it all. Uh, and you got tired of reading the fairy tale where the blondes were always the wonder and the, you know, the older sister with the dark hair was always this evil person. I got really sick of this. And I got sick of, you know, the tall, blonde, handsome hero. I got tired of it. I just got sick to death of, you know, watching the movies and here comes this white tall blonde guy. And it's like, that's going to be the hero and everybody, oh, there's the bad guy. He's wearing the black and he's got the black hair. And, oh, forget it. So I said, I want to write a story where there are two half brothers, opposite backgrounds, opposite points of view, opposite upbringing. So one is a pampered prince, but he's really taught sacrifice yourself for the, for the needs of the many. And the other one who is, trained as a sorcerer, musician, trained from an individual viewpoint where you had to make your own decisions strictly from the bottom up. And one-on-one, -on -one, whatever situation you're in, that is your point of power. So you make your decision from that point of power and you don't think about this existential, what's the good of the many. You react in the moment to what's in front of you. So here are these two half brothers. And so I said, I'm going to make, the guy with the dark hair have more admirable qualities in some ways, starting off. 
and he's a short guy. So I took the, the standard movie hero and just collapsed it. And then I took the other guy and said, I'm going to make him the wonderful, blonde, outgoing, charismatic, everything you'd expect you would see as this is the hero. And I'm going to give him some very unsavory qualities. And then I'm going to shake him up in a box and I'm going to have a fight. I'm going to write a big fantasy. I'm going to write this huge epic and there's going to be a big war and there's going to be, because, you know, I was coming out of all the fantasy that was written at the time. So I said, I'm going to have a world. It's going to have some restrictions. It's not going to be anything goes, but you're not going to see those restrictions. You're not going to see why this planet functions the way it does. You're not going to see what the society functions. I'm going to play on your assumptions on that one too. You think you're in medieval Europe. Well, you're not. So I was mixing and matching all these ideas that gradually as you read the series, they get blown away until you're not in Kansas anymore. And as I was doing it, I said, technologically on this world, because of the restrictions, because of its back history, its cultural nature, its, its makeup, you would have to have technological periods mixed up. So things would develop at uneven time periods compared to Earth's technological history, especially Western technological history. So I set out to do the research to make this happen. I, at the same time as I was traveling the world, because I said, I can't write this without having seen anything. I got to live and do things I wouldn't do. So I did offshore sailing. I did all kinds of very strenuous things that I knew were feeding into this book because I had to do it hands on to really write it and take you there. So I had warfare and I studied warfare from about the Romans up to where gunpowder started really affecting the outcome because I knew I had to mix and match technologies. So I studied all the major history of war. I read books and books and books and books and books and notes and notes and notes and notes about, and I realized at the end of it, really didn't matter who had the bigger force. It really didn't matter who had what going in. There were factors that created the outcome of that war that had nothing to do with whether the cause was right or not nothing to do with that. Just as I had finished all this research, I went into a documentary film, I was in college, and it was a docudrama of Culloden. It's called Culloden, it's in strict black and white. And it recreated the Battle of Culloden as it happened with all of the gloss stripped off, no Bonnie Prince Charlie, no poetry, none of these romantic Scottish novels, none of this history that's been glossed and made, made glorified. It is a brutal war where people were conscripted, dragged into this miserable place. It was freezing cold, it was pouring rain, the terrain ran downhill, and because of incompetent leadership, nobody called the charge. These people were blown to shreds by cannon fire. That is what happened. And Bonnie Prince Charlie with his tea set packed up and ran. So I came out of that film shaking with fury. I was so angry because I said, the news, history, books, poetry, epic poetry, Homer, Iliad, all that just glorified war. And here I had this history that I had just read. And I said, every single battlefield was Culloden Field, every single one. And if the cause that was morally more decent won, it wasn't because might made right. It was because something happened on that battlefield, some alchemy to make it happen. But as many times it went the wrong way as the right way. And I said, fantasy literature is the worst. It is the worst offender of them all. Much as I love Tolkien and all of those, it glorifies you wipe out this and everybody goes home the hero in the end. So that turned the course of the Wars in Light and Shadow. Right there, it turned right and it said, this series is not going to present war as the solution. It is not going to be grim dark. It's going to show horror and beauty all mixed together. You're going to have the full spectrum, the lightest and the darkest, both from the characters to the world, because the world has as much beauty in it as it does ugly. So I can't read Grimdark.
and, and take it that seriously. I do read Grimdark and I love it, but I can't take it seriously because for every ugliness, there's a Mother Teresa and you have to have that full spectrum. So that's what shaped some of the themes, the, certainly the most central theme be, starting out with the Wars of Light and Shadow is that war is not the solution. It happens because we ditched the imagination way too soon. We stopped fighting for a solution that was reasonable. We allowed the situation to blow out of balance and we allowed our beliefs to become a tool for somebody else. The minute that tool comes, that thing comes along that fits your beliefs, you are a marching soldier and you don't question anymore. You take verbatim whatever you're told and you do that and you believe in it fervently. You are just a walking tool the minute you stop thinking. So it's all about critical thinking. It's all about characters not having the full picture and having to do the best they can in the situation they're in. But sooner or later in those books, that edge is going to get peeled off and they're going to see, oh my God, I was wrong. I didn't know enough. I went in and fought this battle and I did not know enough. And what do you do then? How do you reassemble your belief system and your shattered emotional state because you fought on the wrong side maybe for the wrong reasons? And it also takes one person isn't the perfect leader all the time. You really don't want General Patton at the peace table, but when you need General Patton, you need him. So this attitude of one person can be right in every circumstance, I think is a fallacy because those heroic qualities that you need today might be the very thing that upsets the balance tomorrow in the wrong circumstance. So you need a circle of different people with different strengths to really lead in a balanced fashion because we all don't have all the answers. We can't, we're human. We're individuals, we see only one thing, one, one vantage. And that vantage doesn't have enough peripheral vision. We can't be 12 different people from 12 different backgrounds. So I guess it, it not in your face kind of presents that thinking, but that thinking is very much there, is what if you're misled? How do you break out of that? What's, what's gonna take to shake your box enough to see that maybe you were, you were blind? And what happens when you wake up? How do you deal with the emotional fallout? Uh, quick also, question. as in the course of writing that you realize when you do an 11 book series you're not going to you're going to start it maybe in your 20s with the ideas but you're going to finish it when you got a few decades under your belt so you have to build the story to be elastic so that all walks of life can still see something in it it won't date there is no suck fairy with my books because i try to make them elastic enough that you can come back to them two, three, four decades later and they aren't gone. So that viewpoint of being 20, 30, 40, 50 has to be able to expand. So you have to be able to see that as you, or don't even start a big long series like that because you aren't going to write it in five years. Yeah. Uh, Derry had another question for you. Uh, does Jenny have a particular lost or forgotten author to recommend? Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> about 150,000 and how lost and forgotten because you know people I run into today that haven't read Zelazny. Oh, I don't read books. They are, they go back that far and I go Zelazny is so original and so different. You he, you could read them anytime and it would work. Um I read the library. I did not discover science fiction and fantasy until quite late. So a lot of the authors that I say are forgotten are either offbeat, like R.M. Mellick, who wrote a book called Jerusalem Fire, which is, I love that book. It's very, very wrenching because it's about a general who fought a war and discovered he was on the wrong side in the middle of it. And he was considered a war hero and he walked away. So that book's called Jerusalem Fire and it's old, but Roberta is still alive. Um, she's still writing. Fabulous story. Uh, Katie Waitman wrote a book that was about cultural appropriation and what it could mean. And when a culture is repressed or lost and um, becomes a threat to other cultures and an artist trying to recreate that culture's 
uh, cultural um, theater presentation and it's a threat to people. So where does that fit in? Um, that book is called The Marrow Tree and it's brilliant. Uh, I loved Joseph Kessel's The Horseman, which was made into a movie and it was all about the generational gap about what happens when you're in your 20s and you're trying to live your life, take your direction, but your father is such a legendary hero, you know you're never gonna get out of his shadow and it's written in Kazakhstan. So culturally it's very removed from what we are familiar with, but wow, talk about a book about accepting aging and seeing different cultural things that mix and match and blend in that timeless story of a, of a young person overshadowed by their legendary father. It's a very powerful, powerful book. Um, I loved Marcel West's, um, what is it called, uh, Summer of the Red Wolf, where a character is very, very smart, midlife crisis, very ennui. You know, he's in that point of life where you think, why bother? I've seen it all. I've done it all. Well, you haven't. You're going to get your second win, but everybody's got to push past this, this crisis point in their life. And this particular book, he runs across a younger man. And they have a rivalry for a woman. They're both sort of, and they have a rivalry all across the boards, everything they're doing. And the shocking, shocking turn on that book is the older guy second guesses the younger guy and the younger guy wouldn't have even imagined what the older guy was thinking to outwit him. So the course of this rivalry destroys a life. And the survivor has to realize if I hadn't been so clever, all this tragedy might not have happened. And that book was searing. It's just wrenchingly well done. But who's read that in this field? I don't know. So I have a lot of favorites. I love Dorothy Dunnett. She does very, very lush descriptions, very, very three-dimensional characters. She does historical like nobody does, where even the historians say she got all the details right. Her ability to make a place or a time period come alive is unparalleled. And the story she wove has so many reverses in it, it's blinding. Um, I recommend if you want to try a one-off, try her King Her After. It's a Macbeth story, but Macbeth is not the tragic figure. He's the guy working within his culture to unite Scotland. And it's brilliant, but she's slow burn. She writes, she uses language in a very lush way. So you can't rush these books. They're just beautiful. So, you know, I could go on all day with what, what I love to read that people have put aside or forgotten, um, but are favorites on my shelf even today. Daniel Mannix, he's written, you know, my landlord, he wrote The Fox and the Hound that made Disney made into that animated film. But the actual book is about actual fox and an actual hound. And Dan spent so many years working with animals. He really got the animal's perspective. If you want to understand the dynamics between that fox and that hound, the book is brilliant, but you need to read the original. So there's a forgotten author. Who's heard of Dan Mannix? Um, but he's written some amazing work. That's a great. Uh... Great answers there. Uh, Marshmallow08 had a question. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of publication, does gender play a role here since the fantasy genre is largely dominated by male authors? It does now. Far less when I started out. There was nobody dumping on Le Guin for gender. There was nobody dumping on Tanith Lee for gender. Um, back then, science fiction and fantasy had not gone mainstream. It was very, very small. So it was a tighter crowd. We were all misfits and we were all outcasts. It had not gone mainstream. It wasn't cool to be a geek at all. So the women doing that were pretty well just accepted. Uh, and that we went for computers and coding and working the early computer people, lots and lots of my friends were early coders and it was not considered. And they were gamers. They were all that. But the more it moved over into the mainstream and the more it moved over onto the internet, the more those cultural values that are skewed got dumped onto the genre. And I think the internet was where it really, really took off. 
because suddenly people could go on and throw around an opinion and do it under a fake name and there were no repercussions. And at that time, publishing kind of went through a seismic shift and fantasy and science fiction did because YA became a thing. I mean, I wrote books that had younger protagonists, but we had no YA back then. It was just books. They were all written for the same audience. So Cycle of Fire was not considered a YA title. It was just written as a book. So YA became a thing and major bestsellers happened around it. You know, Harry Potter and Hunger Games and all that stuff. Suddenly it became a huge money maker. And the other thing that happened was, and I'm not dissing any books, okay? I read YA, I read romance, I read everything. When I'm in the mood, I will read whatever. Paranormal romance came in and became very strong where the romance writers started playing with fantasy. Wonderful, mix and match, this is phenomenal. But it became gendered because People assumed if you were, and they became very, very famous. And Rice and all those writers became very, very famous. And so huge money was made. So lines began to be drawn that women wrote romance or women wrote YA, and they did not write serious idea books. So they did not write adult epic fantasy. They, so it was easier to make a mark. It was easier to rise up the bestseller list. It was easier to earn money, earn out. If you were a woman writing for children or writing for a different market. And I was actually told by my editor at one point, why don't you switch what you're doing? Why do you keep trying to do these really complicated, really intellectual, really, really deep epic fantasy? Why don't you just write YA? Why don't you go make some money? Do the easy route. And I said, I don't want to write for those people. I don't want to shorten my my sights here I, I set out to do this huge project and it, it is intelligent and it is deep and it will make you think and i said i'm not gonna lose my opportunity to create that just because it was easier and so these seismic shifts happened about that same time that gender became a big issue disney introduced their little princess line and when when, it, when we grew up this toy stores did not gender toys you went down the toy aisle and there were the match of our cars and there were the action figures and there were the dolls and there were the whatever. So a boy was not embarrassed walking down a toy aisle looking at a girl toy or vice versa. It was all the toy aisle. Now we have gendered toys, thank you to Disney Princess because they wanted the Star Wars on the boy side and they wanted the picky things and the dolls on the other side. And now we have this gender thing where if you're a girl walking down the boy aisle, what's the matter with you? or the boy walking down the girl aisle, what's the matter with you? So we created this problem. We created this box. And then we let internet trolls, internet bots, run along with no accountability, and it was totally unmoderated, and misogyny grew like a mushroom. And nobody wanted to stop it, and the same thing happened to people of color, the same thing happened to any minority. And it's run rampant, and nobody wants to put up the hand and say no. So I always go on the internet under my own name. I don't believe in hiding myself and not being accountable. I will say what I say in public. I will say what I say on the internet, same thing. I will talk on the internet as if you're in the room with me. That's the way I believe that we need to learn to live again. But the internet has brought out the best and the worst. So now looking back, writing what I'm writing, I wish I'd gone under gender neutral or a male pseudonym because I would have had less prejudice. And we don't mean to be this way. People reading a book by a woman, they don't mean to be more critical in their reviews or they don't mean to not bother mentioning it or they don't mean to not remember it. It's systemic in our society that because of that byline, it's less weighty. It doesn't stick in your head more and that's why the lists get weighted. That's why the money, the equal pay is certainly not there. And the equal treatment certainly is not there in publishing. And it's sometimes the women dumping on the women. I've had that as often as anything else because it's systemic in the society. So if anything good comes out of it, it's because people are screaming and maybe we'll see a change. But when I started out, I chose to keep my byline because it was not an issue. I had no clue what was gonna come in the future. If I had, definitely, I would have done different. Because who needs to start out with a strike 
against you. So, yeah, I think definitely the kind of books I'm writing sometimes, not all of them, not all of my books are as deep as the ones I'm doing now. There's been a strike against it because they aren't taken as seriously as they should have been, not by the industry and not by the readers. So I'm not writing for women. So automatically, certain certain aspect of I'm not I don't have gendered covers, gendered covers. So some women might not pick up my books because they're afraid of what what might be in them because I didn't make them look like a book that would look like that. So it'll all be outgrown. It won't matter in 50 years. So you, you kind of got to let it roll off your back. But it is a problem. And I'm pleased to be asked to be talking tonight because it isn't talked about enough. But neither am I going to let it stand in my way and let it bother my day and stop me. I'm going to do what I do and let the pieces fall where they may. You know, I didn't want to get into and I And I'm not looking for the, you know, necessarily. I mean, obviously, I, I want you to answer how you want to answer, Jenny. But, you know, how do you feel about, you know, um, the banning of books? Um, frankly, in the United States, that's become uh, like, and again, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not approaching this, this question from a, the politics, the local angle, but, but, but where, where are we going with banning books now? Um, well, you know, what... we're going to push back as hard as we can. Let me tell you an odd, a couple of odd stories. I mean, you're talking to a person that read The Agony and the Ecstasy in like seventh grade. Okay, they wouldn't let me do that today in, you know, going to the library because you know what's in that book. But you know what? Let the people decide themselves. Let the kid figure it out. Um, so I don't think banning books is a good idea. And here's why. I went to Russia. I went to Russia right after the Iron Curtain came down and Nixon opened up the border again. And I went there with a Russian speaking art teacher. And the purpose of that trip was to go see the paintings because there are amazing, or were, they've all been pillaged now, amazing paintings in Russia that they took back after World War II. So I went to Leningrad and I went to Moscow and I took a train between the two and we stopped in a little village. So I was there for probably about two weeks. And this was in like 19... 75 or six in there. Here I was a young person wanting to be a writer artist, very, very creative. And I went into this culture when the Iron Curtain was still there. We got off the plane and there was machine guns pointed to our head. We walked a gamut between 12 guys with loaded machine guns pointed at our head, getting off that airplane and getting back on to go home. I have seen what those regimes look like from the inside. And at that time, I was curious about books. And because we had a Russian speaker, we could escape our trained guide that gave us the propaganda. And so we got out of the box a bit there. So I went to a few bookstores and I looked at illustrated books, mostly in the children's section because I wanted to look at the artwork. And it was totally eerie because all the books looked like they were illustrated by the same person, except for little things around the margins. Occasionally you'd see one guy who'd squeeze something in that looked a little bit original, like he'd have a few little birds or a few little things, except for a couple that were totally radically different. And because we had this art teacher who was Russian and could speak the language, I had him translate and ask the questions. Why does this book look different than these? This artwork is so much more vivid. Oh, that's a classic. It was done before. It was done like in 1900. And these illustrations are accepted because this is a classic fairy tale. And I realized the damage that was done when the state decides who gets to paint and who doesn't. So how many science fiction writers, brilliant artists, brilliant actors, brilliant anything had to drive a bus because that's what the state decided that they were good for. And the state decided that by driving a bus was hugely well paid because you had charge of all those, the safety of those people on the bus. So it was an honored job, different thinking. When you went to the supermarket in those days in Russia, 
the people stood in line for four hours to get their dinner and they didn't get a choice when they got to the end of the line. They bought whatever was on the shelf that day. You got whatever the store had to give you. you no choice. 90% of the goods on the shelves were canned and only two factories canned the food and they did all the label design. It was like having your nerve shot with Novocaine. Everything looked the same, you know, pink and green and gray labels on cans and the other company maybe would do gray and yellow and rows and rows of shelves and everything looked the same because there was no advertising. You come into this culture from that and it's like going into a screaming noise box because we have choices here. You may not like what 99% of what you see in the United States or any country that has the freedom, but we can choose what we do. We can choose what we take home. We can choose what we turn out. We can choose what we eat. People coming from Russia in those days come into our supermarkets and they would cry because they'd never seen a ripe banana available just to the public. The produce, you know, so we live in a really loud culture. Some people in this world don't. So what do I think about banning books? Do you want to live like that? Where one or two or three minds or one or two or three mindsets or one religion or one culture or one, one anything, one point of view decides what you get to grow up and see and not see? I would rather have the full spectrum and choose. And if you don't like it, when your kid brings it home, tell them no or re-educate them or put them in your own little private school where you can protect them, but don't tell the whole rest of the country what they should read and what they shouldn't. And I will say in my background that I volunteer search and rescue. I see suicides and I see problems and I see people that end up in trouble that shouldn't end up in trouble. And too many barriers in a society can make more problems. So this thing of we're saving the children because we're restricting, I don't see that playing out in a good way. I really don't. So I don't believe in banning books. I believe in making choices. And if you are in a situation where you don't want your kid exposed to that, you have a choice what school you send them to. But don't tell the whole rest of the system to bend to what you want. This isn't how we're made. I don't see a book hurting your child that you can't prevent your child seeing that book. If you really, really want to ban your children from those books, then make it your child. Do that for your kid, but don't tell everybody else what to do. So don't inflict it on the school system or whatever. I think kids need to find their own way. And you know what? They're pretty good at it if we don't mess with it. Teach them to be kind. Teach them to share. Teach them to to listen to each other and they'll figure it out. So banning books to me says, don't listen to this or don't listen to that. You're, you're shutting off what you don't even understand. Books never killed anybody. Lack of judgment might do that. So teach your kids judgment, not ban a book. So yeah, it just makes me angry. It enrages me totally. So, uh, it's, it's hard to segue from that, but Stinky uh, Stinky Chicken said, Jenny, I read Delazny. Did I spell it on your recommendation? Oh, and did she like it? I believe so. I'm just trying to catch up with the with the uh, commenter, but uh, so trying to catch up, but also said, dare I ask with the wars of light and shadow coming to a close, what's next? I have probably 11 different ideas, any one of which I could pick up and go. And one of them is even four chapters down. It's another standalone. It's a nautical fantasy. And so more things like Hell's Chasm so that with the changing times, I can turn on a dime um, and not be stuck in a big massive life work that is too rigid to move with what publishing is doing. Um, I'm not going to abandon the Etheran universe because there's lots of untold history. There is so much there. I only use the tiny little tip of the iceberg on that. So expect little short pieces and 
Beyond that, I don't know because I don't know how the series is going to pan out with that final volume. But I'll be looking to write something and guarantee I'm not going to stop. So once I see what happens with this one, um, probably I'll take that one that's four chapters down and complete it first because it's already going. Um, but I don't know what's next, but there's no lack of ideas. And uh, Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Robin says, I love your series, but the, but your standalones, standalones are amazing as well. Well, tell her, thank you. Tell her, I wish I could have done more of them. When I started out with the Wars of Light and Shadows, I thought I could write a standalone in between every volume. But it just took too much energy to create that big series, and the publisher wasn't going to have it. They wanted the series to keep coming out in a regular, and it needed to come out in a regular fashion. So... I literally had to scream and yell and howl to put Hell's Chasm in, in the center of it. So I wrote Hell's Chasm after Peril's Gate. And the reason was I was exhausted emotionally. Peril's Gate was just a ringer to write. And so I wanted to do a one-off just to take my breath and catch my breath and catch my enthusiasm back up. Not that the enthusiasm was flat, but if you've read Peril's Gate, you understand the emotional ringer. The ending of that book was just tough. So... I did Hell's Chasm as a one-off in the middle. And the other reason I did it was because I was getting an awful lot of people claiming I could not bring it home. I could not finish a, a series that, and up until Peril's Gate, Wars of Light and Shadows is still in the growth stage. Peril's Gate's a tipping point. After that, things begin to converge much, much faster. The whole pace of the series picks up because enough of it's on the ground, enough of the layers are on the ground that now I don't have to pause and show you things. So I'm showing you brand new things still, but a lot of things were behind me. So Hell's Chasm was done just to say to the world, look, I can write a five and a half day plot and I can finish it. So don't worry about this big series. I'm going to stick the landing. It's just a long form work. So I made a very short form work in the middle as a break, but as also a card to play for the readership to say, look, I do know how to finish a book and I can do it in a very short, small space. This thing isn't out of control. You just haven't seen the whole picture yet. So be patient. So I love doing standalones. I don't want to connect them to the same universe. They'll always be different. They'll always be new. Expect you'll see more of those in the, in the future. Just trying to catch up with the comments here. So if you had a question, I'm looking through them. <laughs> trying to keep up with all the comments. So, uh, Jenny, what do you enjoy doing when you're not writing? I've always said that writing is taking a little tiny piece of the world and making it huge. So you're looking through the wrong end of the telescope. You're taking a little tiny piece of emotion in your head and you're putting it all over the page because... Story is really the gift of experience given to someone else. So when I'm not writing, I like to go to the other end of things and I like to work with something big where I'm not in control of it and I've got to interact with it. So I do a lot of riding horses. Um, I do search and rescue for my volunteer. Or I do wilderness and urban both. Um, and that's been a whole other set of experience of interacting with the world in a different way. I like wilderness camping. I like sailing. I like offshore sailing where you, you're a little tiny person on a little tiny boat against the elements. Um, so I try to pick the opposite end of the spectrum where the world is really pushing at you and you're the individual, you're the small thing trying to make your way and survive even. So I like to be really hands-on when I'm not actually writing. And I love music. Music is a big addiction. Um, I listen to music when I write. I have a huge CD collection. I love folk music. I love world music. I love, and I play probably five different instruments. I used to do competition piping, both individual and band bagpiping. Um, I got a bunch of guitars, so I like to I like to do that kind of thing too as as a letdown. So outdoors, jogging, 
music. I had to keep one corner of my life that didn't have the killer instinct. So I kind of kept music aside as something I could just play with. Do you have an album that you will never get tired of? Uh, yes, Larry Fast. He did. He does electronic music. It's jaw dropping. He he did it at a time when nobody was really doing it the way he was doing it. And he was very famous for saying, here's what instruments were used and no guitars. So Larry Fast, check him out. Hmm. And I also really, really, really like. Um, oh, come on. Why am I losing? I love Hans Zimmer's film, film music. Uh, that's a big one. And I like, um, oh gosh, my brain is just off tonight. The guy who did tubular bells, what's, I can lay my hand on the CD. Let me do that. Hold on. Oh. Uh. Here we go. Mike Oldfield, that's who I'm thinking of. Mike Oldfield. He is astonishing because you'll listen to his music and he'll go along and it'll just go along and suddenly he will throw in this crashing reverse and suddenly it just gets huge. He played a whole sequence of things where one of the instruments was a toolbox. Hmm. So he'll just chuck any old thing into synthesizer, to voice, to brilliant stuff so i love him for the his ability to surprise you it's just it it's an amazing experience and he's done a lot of different albums a lot of different albums so um yeah if you read has chasm the two albums that went into that was mike oldfield's millennium bell listen to that and listen to han zimmer's soundtrack for um, is the soundtrack for the movie that took place in Rome, the, the gladiatorial games. Gladiator. Gladiator. Yeah, Gladiator. There were two Pro. albums from Gladiator. He actually produced two albums. And there was the music that that whole book came out of right there. Boom. So you can hear that Gladiator theme going in the background. It's So those guys will never go off my shelf. There's a whole list of other ones too, because I was into electronic music and I was into a lot of folk music in Enya before it was all popular because I was listening to that stuff in the coffee shops. Um, Philadelphia Folk Festival was a week of that kind of music. So I listened to a lot of traditional Irish and traditional Scottish and traditional, of course, piping. I played with a lot of those people. So um, the only kind of music I really shy off from is is the really really blue note jazz that just makes me depressed because it's so <laughs> bad and i end up crying so i don't have a lot of that because it just brings my mood down it's beautiful it's well done but it's it's too effective <laughs> it's too good at his job and uh do you have a, a favorite live show experience with the best live show you've seen live show as far as theater uh music Oh, the Moody Blues. My God, do they do a concert. Jaw-dropping. Absolutely amazing. We used to go to their concerts as often as we could, and they did one with the Tampa Symphony Orchestra on the baseball field in Tampa. Not the big stadium. It was a smaller one. And that was amazing because the Tampa Orchestra was not into it. They just, they were hired to do this script. They were not happy you could tell their their hearts were not in the music and i'm sitting here grinding my teeth going this is the most difficult moody blues concert i've ever heard in my life because the orchestra was dragging them down and you know they picked that orchestra up by its bootstraps and they made it happen and about at the halfway point the orchestra caught the bug and it just blossomed and it was like wow these guys stood up on that stage and they dragged that entire orchestra out of their rut and made them perform. And it was just, it rocked by the time that concert was done. 
The other one I remember clearly live performance was Steel Eye Span in Philadelphia. If you ever go to Philadelphia, go to a live concert, doesn't matter what, whether it's the orchestra or whether it's rock, because that city loves music so much, they absolutely blow it out when they get on the stage in Philly. And in the Steel Eye Span concert I went to in Philly, the concert came to the end. They played three encores. The crowd was still on its feet screaming while they were taking the stage apart. And the police had to gently move the crowd out of the theater because nobody wanted to stop cheering. It went on and on and on and on long after the musicians had left. So yeah, see here a concert in Philly, it's an experience you'll never forget. And I would another question from uh, Jennifer. Uh, do you have all the threads of storylines mapped out uh, from the beginning of in your series? Yes, I do. I have massive, massive spreadsheets that have the characters all going across the top and the various factions all going across the top and all the timeline going down the left-hand column. And then each chapter set is a ruled line. And I write... I wrote in exactly which chapters, what occurred in that chapter and which character. So you can look down the whole story for each book and see exactly where the action happened and who did what and how it blended together. And this was necessary because when writing, I had to be able to earmark exactly which chapter that happened in and go back to it to make sure that there were no inconsistencies not only that, if you really read between the lines and you analyze the story and you take it apart, the Wars of Light and Shadows does not backtrack. The action is either simultaneous or forward, unless somebody is having a prophetic dream, which happens only twice, where it's out of sequence. And it was happening in real time because that character was having that experience in real time. So there's none of this read six months with action and then turn the time clock back to six months of action before that never happens. It's either simultaneous or forward. So there was this constant Chinese puzzle, number puzzle, we had to slide this piece aside to get to that piece because in order to make it simultaneous or forward, I had to do the logistics because if this army couldn't move that fast, other action had to take place in between or if this ship couldn't sail that distance in that time span, and this was all rigidly mapped out. I've, I've navigated on offshore. I know how far you can go in a day on foot in a forest or up a mountain or with a boat, with whatever sail rig. So it was meticulously worked out. So you never flash back. You never flash back in time. A character may have a flashback memory, but it's happening in real time. They're remembering it in real time. There is no go back and figure out what was happening while you were doing this. So yeah, I had to, I had to have the storylines mapped out, and I have thousands of years and four epochs of history in file cards in sequence, and you don't see the tenth part of that, even the fraction of that, in the book. But I know back in history what led to this, what happened in this location going back over the years. I know it. It was worked out. But I only used the pieces that were needed for the actual story. And that's where short fiction will come into play or even epic poetry. There's some stuff that happens in the earlier eras that would really fit with epic poetry if I ever get the energy to do it. Um, because there's some pretty cool stuff happened long before this story took place. Um, and there were elder powers that you will not see until the final volume. The elder powers come into play in the final volume and their history goes way back. So some of these pieces you'll get hints and you'll see pieces, but you won't see the full spread unless I choose to write more. But you know, you're gonna write a world like that, it's got to have depth. This book doesn't have the cultural breadth that something like Malaysian does, because it isn't a widespread world when you're seeing it from the human's perspective. You would have to see it from the other living beings perspective to catch that breadth of archeological history for it there. 
the restrictions on what the planet is and who's living on it limit what human beings can do. And this unfolds slowly over the series, over the course of the series. So you're only seeing a sliver because you're only seeing the human history, which is a narrow, narrow portion of the entire worldview. Human beings were only on this planet for about 5,500 years. Uh, but the other, other things were there sooner. And those histories go way back. And human history before human beings came to this planet goes way back as well. So there's a lot that isn't shown on the page in these stories. Hmm. So with your with your series mapped out from the beginning, is do you ever, are you ever tempted to tell someone what the end is going to be before it's finished? Do you ever want to spoil somebody just to get it out? The only time I would ever do that is if somebody was dying. <laughs> Literally, you get a letter from somebody who says, what was it, the heartbreaker? I'm about to go under, undergo major brain surgery and I'm not going to come out of it the way I am now. So I might have told them this or that, but no, I keep it under the, I kept it under the hood. I have a couple of beta readers who have read it. And I know I've stuck the ending because my betas all came in and they all came in excited about it. I made sure that absolutely I topped everything that had gone before. So I want you to have that experience and that discovery. I don't want to wreck it. I don't want to wreck the pie. I'm not going to tell you. The only thing I'll tell people in advance is if you read any of my other books, I never write the same ending twice. So if you read it in another book, it ain't going to happen in the series because the endings are not going to be the same thing over and over. And that's a challenge, but it's one that I think is important. I don't want a predictable book ever. If I have to write a predictable book, I'm going to chuck the pen and say, that's it. <laughs> uh, discussing, discussing the endings of a, of a series it reminds me of a, a conversation uh, PL and I had uh, was it a few days ago about Game of Thrones and the Song of Ice and Fire series, about how difficult that must be for George R. R. Martin to, to finish that series now after what's happened with the TV series. I think it helped going in to have a plan because a lot of the themes and the points and the the richness of what happened in the series got developed as I went because I spent 30 years planning this thing before I wrote book one and I drafted all the way up through Peril's Gate before I sold book one so I actually the earlier books came out faster because I had working draft and from Peril's Gate forward, I was working lifetime. And so people go, well, you've really slowed down. Actually, I hadn't. I just hadn't done the, the same amount of work because some of it had been done behind the scenes. So the original outline that I had, that I wrote when I had that very first idea about the two brothers coming from opposite sides and having a conflict where you have two sides of a picture, I never deviated from that outline. It went exactly, the high points of that outline are all in the books. More got added, richness got added, other themes and layers got added, more background and history got added. So the way it played on the page, I did not know every single page, no. But I took the time because a long form work like that, you can't just, some people can pants it, maybe they can, but what if you lose control of it? I mean. What happens when you get bored? You can't, and you add a new character in to keep it fresh, and suddenly you have a, a roster of 2,000 characters, like Wheel of Time got. 2,000 characters? Poor Brandon had to figure that all out to finish it. 2,000 characters' threads he had to finish up. I kept the cast that mattered very small, and secondary characters come into prominence, and then they may drop away because of the time span. Maybe, you know, they're not there. But some of those characters have long lifespans or they're semi-mortal, they last. So I deliberately kept that nucleus theme tight so that you won't see why certain scenes in Curse of the Mistraith are there until you read the final volume. So often people, when they say, what's going on in this book? I don't get it. You don't understand why you're seeing that scene in depth. But that depth is going to be needed for when things really heat up 
and it fires because there's more than you're seeing that meets the eye on that scene. And when you come back with your worldview and you understand all the perspectives that were really happening on the page in that scene, you'll read that scene again and go, wow, look at all this other stuff I couldn't see because my own assumptions blinded me or I didn't know enough to see the whole picture. So you read volume one after completing the series, it's a whole other story because suddenly you know what you're seeing and you go, my God, it's all on the page. It's all there. But what was important to me when I read it, I couldn't see because the things that I didn't understand yet weren't important yet. They become important later. So volume one is a little bit of a challenge because I'm carrying all these things and I know they're there and I had to parse very carefully what I showed you and I knew you were gonna miss massive portions. But that's part of the beauty of the series is the unveiling of what you missed and where your assumptions led you astray and where the characters' assumptions led themselves astray. What happens when you discover what you were really seeing the whole puzzle changes and it grows with your life experience as well. So I can't speak for other writers. Everybody's process is their own, but I do believe that some works are meant to be long form works and some works are not. And a long form work can perform in ways a short form never can touch, but it's definitely a bigger enterprise. And I didn't, I pantsed parts of it, but also I planned parts of it, but I didn't let it get out of control because I knew what I was setting out to do and I stuck to those goals. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The 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 depth and I mean that is just how comprehensive what you described is is just totally mind boggling. You know, and to someone like me who I believe that I have, you know, a somewhat micro fraction uh of immersion with my series, you know, compared to something what you're writing and, and I'm here thinking, okay, well, you know, people are really going to see, you know, down the road, what's really going on. It's going to take them, you know, it's going to, they're going to realize what's important and, and, and why I did this and, you know, but, but not, a, not, not, you know, it's pointless even trying to compare the scale. Um, when we're talking about your work that is just, just completely immersive. You know, like I said, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's outstanding. Wow. Well, it helped I that I started very, very young. And it helped that I realized I was in over my head and did not produce this as my first book. I said, in no way am I ready to handle this big thing. I'm not going to have the self-control as a writer to understand what to put on the page or not. Didn't matter. I still filled up five, six, seven, eight spiral bound notebooks and thousands of pages of hand typed on a, a Corona portable typewriter, you know, one of those old mechanical deals. I wrote it anyway, but having the judgment to know which parts of that draft needed to revamp, which parts should be chucked out and, and overwritten altogether. I had to do that with experience. So I knew that that was not going to be my first book. It totally wasn't. So I wrote two trilogies, three standalones before this thing even got started. So um, it was very important to recognize that I was in over my head that young, that that wasn't the time to launch this massive project. So um, a lot of that planning, I wasn't on the public stage doing it. I didn't have fans and readers badgering me. It was all hidden under a blanket until I chose to release it. Like I said, I sold volume one as a complete book. No outline, I sold it to the editors as a finished manuscript. So I think it hurts if you try to do that all on the public stage because, you know, just the the battering of what of opinions hitting you and what your readership is demanding of you. By the time my readership gave a darn what I was doing, it was already formed enough I could stand my ground. And that came with creatively editing it too, as far as the publishers, which publisher was going to, and, you know, the editors, it was, it was odd because when I sold the first volume, the editor I had at the time said she didn't want to know what the ending was. She wanted to read the books as they came out. So I didn't have to explain what was what was happening here. I had a lot of freedom to. And then by the time the editors had shifted five or six or seven times, they were too busy with the authors they had bought. 
So pretty much this series was designed, packaged, and produced exactly as I wanted it to be. And if there's flaws, it's my fault. And uh, Jennifer says, I loved your ending in Masters of Whitestorm. It really moved me. Yeah, it did to me too. That was, <laughs> it was an interesting, as I thought I was going to sell that to short magazines as a sequence of short stories, but I couldn't sell them as short stories. And then the first editor who ever bought my first novel said she wanted to see it as a epic fantasy. So I had to novelize it later. So it really has the flavor of old sword and sorcery shorts until you get into the psychological makeup of really what makes a hero. And the ending was very powerful because the whole book is about facing your worst fear. And facing your worst fear, in many ways, the person you are has to die. Because you're so terrified, you're going to avoid it. You're going to not let that piece of yourself die. You're not going to let go of that piece of yourself that that fear has control of. So it was all about letting go of that fear by facing it and facing it sometimes means having the courage to let everything go. So the psychology of what makes a hero, can a hero be made by their trauma and their flaws? Um, it's a different kind of hero than the hero that I wrote in Hell's Chasm. Very, very different. Two different warriors that come from two very different backgrounds. So I'm pleased that you enjoyed that story because it's very dear to my heart, Master of White Storm. But yeah, it is very episodic until it starts knitting together and you start realizing who this person really is that's doing all these impossible feats. Um, if you're not familiar with the book, it's about a mercenary who gets in, hired to do impossible jobs. And he's not Conan. He's not the muscle man. It's determination, but it's all about being motivated by your fears. And what happens when you decide to cast that off? So yeah, if you're worried about the series, didn't write the same ending I wrote in Master Whitestorm. <laughs> well, I can't wait to enjoy uh, the rest of your work. I have uh, I have ships of Maria coming up um, uh, as part of my. Uh, my March of the Sequel reads, and and of course, you know, I have the benefit of of all the rest of your amazing work uh, in front of me. So I'm really, really, really enthused about that. And it's going to take me a while to get through, and that's a good thing because your work is meant to be. This favored. is fair. I got to wait for you to write yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I I have a long way to go. Um, you know, I, I'm writing a seven book series right now, and I too have, you know. Well, as Steve knows, I have 20 books planned in my universe to start, and we'll see what happens after that, how long I live. But, um, yeah, I, 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 I understand. Again, it's not on the magnitude. It, obviously, it's not up to, up to the same writing level, but it's, it is planned out, and, and it is, um, you know, hopefully it's immersive and that people will go, whoa, okay, I didn't see that coming, and I didn't really understand uh, where you were taking this until... Um, I got to the end, and now I really don't understand what's to come in a good way, right? So, um, well, you've that. set up some very powerful dynamics, and I can't wait to read it. This is my kind of stuff, and so I'll just I'm very patient. I will never push an author to produce a book before they're ready, it needs to come out when it's baked and be right. But I gotta wait for years in real time. Mine can sit on your shelf and gather dust, and you pick them up if you want. <laughs> no, they won't be getting dust. I'll be, I'll be reading them quite regularly, and and you know, and and but also, uh, you know, enjoying them, right? Savoring them and and savoring, you know, a couple of your books, uh, you know, every year, and, and you know, and that'll still take me, you know, ten to fifteen years to get through them all. So that's uh, that's that's perfect, um, you know, because um, I, I want to enjoy your work. Um, I, I, your writing is, like I said, it, I said in my reviews, you know, the prose is is something. You just can't find it anywhere. Uh, I haven't found it anywhere, and I, you know, I, I, I've read a lot of writers that have phenomenal prose. You know, uh, you know the, you know the the some of the the writers that I, I really admire. Uh, I admire their books specifically because of their prose. Uh, the Tessa Grattans, like there's there's tons, but your prose is just. Well, thank it. you. It's, you it's know, asking me about the books that made me, you asked me to write that 
piece, you and Beth, that I read the library. I read the library. I read it all from Shakespeare to trash novels to romance to mysteries to historicals to back before paperbacks were a thing. A lot of these big old hardback authors like Thomas Costain and Mary Stewart. So I, that's, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I really am. Um, I don't sit here and use reference books to find the words. The words are there. So I'm using the precise word and I'm not going to pull my punches in, especially in the big series, but that's where that came from was that reading background that was, had such depth because people weren't afraid to use language then. And if you've ever sat down and read letters from soldiers in the civil war, the words they used to describe their experiences way past what we would consider college reading today. Mm -hmm. Language has juice in it. It has power in it. And dumbing it down gives away the richness and the precision that we could be putting into our stories. So I hope that the internet and public media doesn't strip that away. You know, I remember growing up when newspapers and magazines decided that third grade reading level was as far as they could push print media for news because they didn't want to lose their audience. And immediately we began to lose a richness and precision in language because all those words do not mean the same thing. Synonyms do not mean the same thing. There are shades of meaning. So it's like telling an artist, you only get the colors that are in that box of cray crayons. You can't mix and blend anymore. You know, the human eye can see nuance that a camera cannot see. When you look at a cloud and you see a photograph of a cloud, it never compares to the reality because your eye is more sensitive. So I love that richness of language. And I don't want to see that juice be squeezed away by common denominator, especially now that we have electronic devices and you can look up anything instantly mm -hmm. on your phone. Yeah, just just for everybody's reference, um, you know, uh, Jenny uh, graced uh, before we go blog, which Steve and I are, are both bloggers for with, uh, you know, Beth Tabler, our wonderful uh, boss at before we go blog. She conceived the theme month uh, for March about the books that made us and Jenny was kind enough to submit uh, a, a guest article um, called ground floor. I recommend anybody, anybody and everybody read it it's it's a great 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 article and um really gives you some some uh a view and a peek into you know um you know what it's like to to be able to absorb that kind of literature from the past you know depending of course on you know your age and your frame of reference and you know but yeah it was just an amazing you know it was really funny one day on twitter i got on real time tweeting back and forth with Miles Cameron, Christian Cameron, because he's a historical writer too. If you're not aware, he's written historicals for forever. Amazing man. And we just started comparing books. Have you read this? Do you like that? What books? And we just went on and on for like an hour or two exchanging this book list. Um, there's another writer who's really, really widely read. And I miss that, you know, I miss writers who sit up there on these panels and say, oh, I don't read. I started to write and I stopped reading. And, you know, Stephen King said 50% of the time he reads and 50% of the time he writes. Why not? I mean, as an artist, I go to museums and I look at art books and I look at pictures for hours when I'm going to start a painting. This is what feeds the grist for the mill. So read, just read because how can you write if you, if you don't have that richness and that depth? If you can't be in awe of what somebody else did, how do you reach for something bigger than what you are? I love it when I catch a book that, ah, oh, I wish I'd thought of that idea, or wow, that person can really write, they can write rings around me. Give me that book, because it's gonna stretch me as a writer to reach higher. Well, I can tell you, Jenny, that's what your books do for me. They, 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 you're one of those writers there. There are several, but you, you know, when I think about that list, uh, you know, you're, you're one of those writers that makes me want to be better. I want to keep improving. I want to keep working and, and, you know, 
and that inspiration that wow you know like look at what Janny words can do like uh, you, know, you got to step up like, it'll, it'll blow me out of the water because <laughs> there's other writers that blow me out of the water every day i can tell you i'll give you a list if you want to really stretch i'll give you a list there, we live in an amazing world there's always something to reach for well, we so do have a question, question there, sir. Yeah, we do have a question about a list here in a minute. But the first, uh, Jennifer has a question. Do you know if there will be some kind of special edition uh, printed for the entire series once it is complete? I hope so. Make a lot of noise, scream and yell on the internet, say that you want it, tell my publisher you want it, tell the people who do those kind of things that you want it. Because you know what? If enough people let people know that it's wanted, it will happen. Um, I would love it because, honestly, there is a mess of artwork. I could do an illustrated edition of this thing that would blow you off the wall mm. because there's artwork all over the place in this house um, and more could be made. So it's a dream of mine. I would love to see it happen. I would love to see the art book that companions this. I would love to see it. So definitely make noise because the more people know about the series and the more it's talked about, the more chance that will happen. But it's a dream of mine. It's a dream I share. So if it's possible to do it, let me tell you, I will jump on it. Awesome. And uh, Jennifer has another question. Uh, Jenny, do you have a list of book rec recommendations published anywhere? Um, book published anywhere? Well, what do you want authors or published anywhere? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, a list of book recommendations. So do you have a list uh, somewhere where we can search a list of book recommendations that books that you would recommend? Uh, go to our fantasy and look up my name on our fantasy and go back my posts. Cause I did a lot of recommending over the years. So just keep scrolling back and scrolling back and you will see all kinds of gems go to um sometimes every now and again i'll get down on something in the world and i will start boosting authors on twitter and i will start listing lots and lots of books that you never heard of and i will push them really hard um so i periodically spit out huge lists um and sometimes i do even essays where i'll pick 10 titles mm -hmm. and just go after them so probably the easiest to access on the internet would be look on my back posts on our fantasy on Twitter and I'm under my own name. So, or on our fantasy Reddit, which is heavily moderated. I should add, it is not a nasty place to be. They keep that shop clean there. It's really worth, um, if anybody's ugly to somebody, they get banned, they get knocked out. Um, the moderators do a phenomenal job. So if you dig in that backlist, you'll see quite a lot of books that I've gone through, mostly fantasy and science fiction. If you want to know other books that are not that, ask me, because I'm not exactly hard to reach. I appear here and there, I got a Twitter feed, so just ask. I don't necessarily use Facebook heavily, um, but I'm certainly looking at Twitter, so if you ask me at Twitter what, what kind of book you're looking for, I'll make a recommendation, and maybe some of my other author followers and other blogger followers and people, book people might add on to it. So you might get some more than you bargained for. And uh, Stinky Chicken had a question. Can we get a link to Jenny's editor, please? <laughs> I am published by HarperCollins UK Voyager. And Natasha Barden is the head of that line. And it's Vicki Leach, who is working with me just at the moment. But I would add a caveat. Let them know, but don't be nasty because these people are extremely understaffed, horribly underworked, drastically underpaid. They're under more stresses than you have any idea. So be polite and be nice. Don't bombard them. Um, and they also have feeds. They show up periodically in social media. So if you're just requesting that you want an audio book or you want a special edition or you would like this, just be polite and brief because these people have enough on their plate without, and it won't reflect well on me if you're nasty to them. So, um, but I would always credit the people who have done well by me. I'm not going to make a secret of my team. They're there to help. Yeah. You get more bees, bees with honey than you do with vinegar. I, I just want to let everyone see this is a, this is a copy of to ride cells chasm. Uh, the standalone I'm talking about that is my, 
favorite standalone of all time. I mean, when you look at this cover and you realize that Janny did, did, did the illustrations, it's just phenomenal. And then the the insides, I I, I you know, it's just yeah, it's it's phenomenal. Uh, same with um, Curse of Miss Wraith. Uh, you know, these are just beautifully illustrated books that I'm holding up here. So um, yeah, go on Janny's website. It's my recommendation. You can see a lot of her. Her amazing artwork, her husband Don's uh, artwork. It's just, it's, it's, yeah. It's There's a whole artwork gallery. Um, I illustrated books for other things beside my work. When I was working in the beginning, I had to establish my creds as a cover illustrator. So I did science fiction, I did other fantasy, I did a lot of other paintings. Um, I was lucky enough to be in a NASA show where they had science fiction and photographs from NASA. It was their 50th anniversary, NASA. And so there's a lot of artwork on the website and the art gallery that you would not necessarily have been familiar with that are not connected to my books at all. Wow. Yeah, bookmarks, indestructible bookmarks. This, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just what an enriching experience to read something, you know, so lush and so full and then to to just stare at the, you know, the artwork for, you know, for hours. It's just, yeah, it's just amazing. Wonderful. So Jenny, I want to thank you for, for joining us tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure and want to thank you for your time. We know you're busy, so we really appreciate it. Well, I really appreciate you having me on here. If you guys have a link, if this is accessible to people after, or if it's just live, but if you have a link where people can access it, let me know because I will get my people to put that link where it can be found off the website. We have areas that this sort of thing is posted because you guys, you're giving your time too. You give back so much to the community and it's all volunteer and it's all done because you love it. And you guys, the work you do is totally amazing. It's totally amazing. So I have to hand it to all of you for taking the time and spreading the love because it wouldn't be such a family without you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All credit to Steve. This is his channel. Oh. Uh, he was he was kind enough to have me as a guest host. And um, so really this is this is this is Steve is is you know, I can't thank him enough. And to have so you know, amazing creatives such as yourself, Jenny. Yeah, that's 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 all due to this man here. I guess, sorry, it's that way. I was getting confused. Oh, thank you. Steve. <laughs> thank you so much, Steve. It means a lot. Oh, I'm, I'm just part of a, like you said, just a bigger group of, of people who really care and support each other. So I'm, I'm just happy to be here. So thank you for, for coming by and I will have the uh, podcast and um, a YouTube link for you here sh just shortly. Okay. Well, just get it to me when you can and I'll make sure that it's put in a place and th those links are permanent, you know, until you dissolve. Um, so people, because that way your time can, can extend to whoever discovers you later too. Awesome. Appreciate that. Awesome. Awesome. Um, have a wonderful night. Thanks so much everyone for, for, for joining us. I'm, I'm sure it was a big treat to have, to have Jenny here. Um, you know, certainly a big treat for us and, uh, you know, uh, this is, uh, this, this is a, a great way to, to have, uh, have our second episode of page doing a, you know it's, it keeps getting harder to top but you know it's <laughs> wow wow it's amazing exactly well thank you everyone for coming thank you very much and thank go you. home and do something that you love <laughs> okay have a great night take care Thanks, okay bye bye thank you bye bye